Now, you guys uh, have provided and equipped so many individuals yes. and so many churches with the ability to defend their faith. You guys have a creation museum with literally hundreds of thousands of people coming and learning the truth. What all are you guys doing? Five years since uh, the Creation Museum has been open. You know, it was open in 2007, and so it's five and a half years now. We've had 1.7 million people, over oh, 1.7 million people come through the Creation Museum. Crazy. Well, actually, it's a fairly special week for me, too. You see, the Thunderfoot Channel might be a couple of years older than the Creation Museum, but it's also had a little bit more than 1.7 million visitors. Indeed, this month, the Thunderfoot Channel passed 50 million video views. And with that, I give you Why Do People Laugh at Creationists, part 39. You know, one of the dilemmas of people who believe that the Bible is the truth, no matter what reality has to say on the matter. The best evidence, you can look at all that science, the best evidence of Noah's flood is God's word. His, he has revealed to us there really was a worldwide flood. Is in Noah's flood, how on a planet whose entire surface has been underwater for about a year. That there was a global flood at the time of Noah's day. And so all the life on the land was destroyed except those on Noah's ark. And Noah's ark landed in the Middle East and the animals and people got off the ark. That is, it killed off all of the trees, all of the plants, leaving the planet entirely dead. Do you manage to say, for instance, get all of the kangaroos and koalas back to Australia? That's almost halfway round the world, across this almost lifeless and therefore food-free landscape. I mean, just to put this all into perspective, if Noah had a decent airplane with all of the infrastructure to run it at his disposal, it would still take him about 10 hours just to fly to Australia to drop off the koala bears before coming back. Well, Conservopedia, that's the uh, trustworthy encyclopedia, has an explanation for how these animals might have gotten this far. And that's that there are volcanoes in the Mount Ararat region that could have thrown small animals great distances. Specifically, it says, the post noachian flood volcano theory comes from the example of Krakatoa, which in 1883 erupted and destroyed most of the island, thus remaining lifeless for many years. Still, the same life that was there before the eruption eventually came back. It's possible that volcanoes in the Mount Ararat region were able to transport the smaller animals over much greater distances than the animals could get by just walking. Now, bear in mind what I just told you. If you were to fly to Australia in an airplane just below the speed of sound, it still takes you about 10 hours. So in this creationist model, to get the small fluffy animals to Australia, all the velocity must be given to the animal during a um, uh, launch, and the rest of the 6,000 mile journey will be an unpowered, that is, a ballistic trajectory. Now, there are three problems with this. The first is, exploding volcanoes tend to kill everything. For instance, this is just what a half atmosphere pressure wave will do to someone. Blast injuries to exposed personnel, represented by this dummy, is usually severe over 3 psi. Here it was 6 psi. And notice that the person here only travels a few feet, and this blast would have likely caused him serious injury or killed him. That is, a volcanic eruption that is capable of transporting small animals further than they could get by just walking it is also likely to turn them inside out. Fluffy animals or not, they are not going to survive the launch. I mean, damn, the volcanic eruption they cite. Krakatoa devastated and killed everything. It did not result in small, fluffy Sumatran animals raining down in Singapore. The second problem is the ballistic trajectory that you would need to follow to get further than you can get by just walking, say, for instance, from the Middle East to Australia. And maybe the easiest way to put this into perspective is the V2 rocket. This was the first man-made machine to get into space, the first man-made object to take pictures of the Earth from space. A huge projectile drops the Earth behind at the tremendous speed of 4,000 feet per second. The rotation of the rocket causes the planet to spin before the lens, and the camera photographs the Earth 65 miles straight down. The horizon, 720 miles away, and the curvature of the Earth are astonishingly apparent in this still picture from the film. 
An observer in the rocket could have seen San Diego, Salt Lake City, Kansas City, and San Antonio. And it only had a range of a couple of hundred miles. And that really isn't in the league of being able to transport animals further than they could get by just walking. And it was uh, about a minute long burn, and then it stayed on this unpowered, that is, a ballistic trajectory. However, the ballistic trajectory that would take you from the Middle East to Australia will mean that you will spend about one hour in space. Now, I don't think I'm going out on too much of a limb when I say most of the Australian wildlife can't survive an hour without oxygen, let alone an hour in the vacuum of space. The third problem that you come to is the landing. Indeed, most of the V2s free-falling from space were supersonic on impact. Now, small fluffy animals, of course, have a lot more air resistance and so would hit the ground considerably slower. But nonetheless, they have to survive the free fall from space. Now, this guy was weak. Not only did he jump from only about 40 kilometers rather than the 100 or so needed for the ballistic trajectory to get you from the Middle East to Australia, but he also had a parachute. Now, I've got to admit, I don't know that much about animal husbandry. But it does occur to me that the creationist proposal about the post-flood dispersal of critters does seem to ignore some rather critical factors about the survivability of animals. For instance, the volcanic eruption is more likely to fry your funnel webs rather than give them safe transit halfway around the world. Or that an hour or so without oxygen will not do your koala bears much good. You see dinosaurs on the ark? They're kind of big, aren't they? Well, the big ones were big, but the little ones were little. And Noah was 600 years old when he went on that boat. I just bet he was smart enough to figure out you don't have to bring the biggest ones. Bring two babies. Or well, similarly, I don't think that a baby kangaroo that has managed to survive being hit by an explosion that would fire it further than it could get by walking and has managed to somehow hold its breath for the hour or so long trip and somehow managed to survive being in the rather hostile vacuum of space. Free falling from the edge of space is going to give you a healthy kangaroo population in Australia. Now, I know kangaroos are fairly bouncy creatures, but I really don't think that rolling your knees when you land is the sort of thing that is going to make you survive the free fall from space. But the trustworthy encyclopedia isn't done there, for its article on Australia says... Contrary to that, young Earth creation scientists assert that the entire subset of all of the Earth's species of kangaroos, wallabies, and other similar creatures travelled together to Australia following the Great Flood. It's not known whether they communicated the idea amongst themselves or all went the same way by chance. Yeah, the wallabies and such like embarked on a 6,000 mile journey across a dead Earth. And while they were not able to thrive anywhere on the 6,000 mile journey somehow managed to prosper happily in Australia when they ended up and only in Australia. Hmm, <laughs> I guess maybe the Galapagos tortoises went with them and just communicated amongst themselves that they would swim the last 12,000 miles. Oh, it's nice to know that we've got Conservapedia to let us know what creation scientists are thinking.